Okay, so uh, we have patrons that are going to watch uh, the class later, the replay, and we also have people who bought tickets who couldn't make it but are going to get the replay. We might have to think of a better time. Uh, so if you listeners have any idea, let me know what works for everybody so it's better when we're together live, but that's okay. It's still going to be a great time. So we're going to go ahead and uh, get started. So I just want to share a little bit about me for those who don't know. Uh, my name is Jesse. I'm the founder of uh, Humans Are Divine. And Humans Are Divine is all about uh, accessing and living as our as what I call our, our true self, which is just your best self. You know, it doesn't have, it's not some weird thing. It's, it's just you, the, the you that you love and you do the things that you love and live the life that you love, but you live it as your best self, free from all of the things that get in the way of us, of us doing that. Um, uh, I live in Los Angeles, California. Uh, in former lives, I've been a senior sales manager. I've been a photographer. I've been a graphic designer. I've actually been a Christian minister, believe it or not. Uh, and now I run Humans Are Divine, and my passion is to mentor people and help them meditate and also just learn things, again, that are going to help them uh, wake up to and live as their best self. Uh, it's not a, it's not flowery, flowery language. It's real and there's real results that not only have I experienced, but others, and we're following the same practices that these people have done, uh, whether they're Buddhist, whether they're Christian, whether they're, they're, they're this or that, um, we're all on the human journey together. And so that is what I am all about, and that's what we're all about. There's books, there's books everywhere and podcasts everywhere, but there's something powerful about relationship and, and spiritual relationship. So um, I also wanna say, for this talk, you're gonna get the replay. So just enjoy the talk. This is not a time to, to take notes. This is not a time to have that. You're, you're not in school. Okay, you're gonna learn some stuff, but you're gonna you're gonna really appreciate what you learn more and enjoy it more if you just listen. Just it's me and you, we're friends, we're having a coffee. And and when you when you're open and you're just here and present. You're, you're, you're going to receive things. You're going to like be inspired. You're going to be like, oh, I like that. That spoke to me. Oh, my God, I realized something. It's harder for that to happen when you're in school mode and taking notes and things like that because you're not sometimes you're not really present. So uh, please, you'll get the best out of this if you just relax, but also be attentive, find that perfect balance and just listen and enjoy. And then when you watch the replay, you can take notes and get the slides and all of that kind of stuff. Um, I also want to say that, you know, we live in a world with a million different perspectives and that's okay. That's beautiful. I, I love diversity. I love inclusion. So if something I say doesn't speak to you, that's okay. You can just let it go. You can just let it come and let it go. You don't have to get mad or, or be critical um, because then you're going to miss out on what will speak to you. So, you know, truth is truth and whatever works for you, great. And whatever doesn't, that's okay. Uh, we're not going to agree on everything, but uh, whatever we do agree on can be very helpful for you. So uh, the purpose of this specific talk, uh, a holy, uh, what, I, what I call a sermon on the holy virtue of silence, uh, is about silence. So what, what are virtues? Virtues, we think of things like patience or generosity or kindness. All of these things have to do with human connection, of, of how we can enjoy relationship together. And so it, these things get us out of our, our isolated individual selves and they connect us with people. Uh, that's what we want. We, 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 we want healthy families we want to be in love we want best friends why because that's what we're here for and when we don't know how to live virtuous which is just an old way of saying just being human we we lose those things we get into arguments and we, and there's falling outs and things like that and we don't want that and so the virtue of silence is actually one of the best virtues some some christian monks would say it's the best of the best because when you're silent and not so absorbed in your thoughts, your your desires, your opinions, your judgments, you, 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 what happens? You start to connect with people more. So it is a virtue. It is something that is good, whether whether you believe in God or not, because I will be using Christian vocabulary for this talk, just because that's the nature of this talk. Um, but whether you identify as agnostic, atheist, Christian, or non-Christian, that's okay. The practices you learn, you can still get something out of it that are, that are going to get you out of your ego, get you out of your yourself, and get you more in, in, in relationship with those around you. Uh, and and, and that's, that's beautiful. And so, you know, according to, according to the Christian monks and mystics that have come and gone, you know, 
we do that by learning to live in synchronicity and awareness with the reality of, of the divine that is that is that is with us. You know, I don't know about you, but I grew up in church and in church we were taught God is omnipresent. What does that mean? He's everywhere. You can't go anywhere where he's not. And so if that's true, how do how come I don't always feel good? How come I, you know, why why did I go through so many issues today or, or what have you? You know, what's the what's the issue here? Well, you know, through silence and through stillness, and we're gonna get into these things, and you know, we learn to, you know, wake up to this reality that's all around us and to enjoy it. Um and so that's the purpose of this class is, is for people who believe in the divine and however way you think about it is fine. And we want to live in that 24 seven. And that is possible by the way. So don't, don't be uh, dissuade. We can do that. And so that's what this class is about is, is to talk about that. How can we don't always experience awareness of the presence of the divine? How do we get there? What do we have to do? Uh, so yeah. I also want to talk about what, what it looks like. What does it look like? What is my life going to be like when I start to more and more, bit by bit, tap into uh, awareness of the divine reality that's all, always here? Because people have different understandings of this. And so I want to make it clear that you are not going to lose your humanity. You're, you're still going to have the same hobbies that you had before. You're still going to be the same person. You're still going to be a normal person but you're just going to be free and you're always going to be, yeah, you're always going to be in a good mood. Uh, and even when things maybe bother you, it doesn't, they don't bother you as much as, as, they, as they, as they do before. Sometimes when we Christians, what they've done is, you know, when you look at the history of the Catholic and the Orthodox saints and, and monks and mystics, you know, sometimes they would experience uh, what are known as ecstasies or, or uh, uh, moments of union with God. And so they did uh, this. Th and this is all documented stuff. OK, that they would, you know, you know, be on the floor and they would just be like, you know, tranced out on 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 the presence of love and things like that. Um, that's 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 OK. And, and, and I'm not against those experiences, but. That's not what it means to live in the awareness of God's presence. Because if it was, well, then why do we have Ferris wheels? Why do we have restaurants? Why do we have good TV shows? Like, why do we have nature? Why do we have, you know, all of these things, sailing, you know, like, you know, God made this world to be enjoyed. And so if if union with God looks like, you know, praying 24 seven in a room and not enjoying life, that just doesn't make sense with why creation is here. So. Um, hey, there may be moments when you're in prayer and you cry and you have emotions and that and that's great. Uh, sometimes you just need a divine hug to to, to love on you. Um, but that's not something that will happen 24/7. And some people they're really going for that. They they want to live in that 24/7. That's not really healthy. Um, you know, God the Son. Christians teach that God the Son became a human. And, and uh, you know, as my favorite theologian says, I'm sure that God, I'm sure that Jesus built more tables than he did miracles. So we need to have this balance between regular life and spiritual life, um, because otherwise we kind of get off, get off course and, and we become less normal and less down to earth. OK, so uh, that's the goal of this class. So, again, uh, there's there's three parts. We're going to talk about, uh, you know, the fact that we're always in God's presence and why we just, why we don't get it. How come I don't feel it? How come I don't feel good all the time? Uh, then we're gonna go into part two. We're gonna talk about uh, a very famous Christian theologian and mystic, and, and, and we're gonna follow his thought process of how we can live in the continual awareness of God's presence. And we're gonna do that because he has some great stuff to say, but we're also gonna do that because I want you to understand that this is not all about what I think. OK, of course, I'm, I'm giving you my version of, of, of this, but I'm following a tradition that, that that goes back, you know, thousands of years ago. OK, so and, 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 and we're part of this community and we're part of this family. And so it's not just about me or you. We're, we're part of something bigger. And then finally, we're going to get practical and we're going to talk about how we how we do it. So hopefully you get hungry and you're like, oh, my God, OK, God's always here. I can, I can be free. How do I start to tap into that? Uh, and we're, we're going to talk about how to do that. OK, so before we do that, uh, this wouldn't be a, a, a good talk on silence unless unless we actually practice silence. So we're going to just for two minutes. I promise it'll go by real quick if you, if you don't want to do this. Uh, we're going to we're going to practice silence. I'm going to walk you through it. Um, so let me go ahead and get my timer going here. Okay. Okay, so let's go ahead and close our eyes. 
And all I want you to do is I just want you to keep your spine straight, but the rest of your body can be relaxed. Your shoulders, your, your hands can be heavy on your lap. You know, just, just you want to be in a relaxed place, but you want your spine straight to help you be attentive and aware. And we want to find that perfect balance. Okay, so here we go. And all we're going to do is we're just, just like you can, you can physically rest, we're just going to mentally rest. We're going to rest in our heart. We're just going to go, ah. Because if God's here, when we let go and relax, and it makes sense that we would just be in his presence. There's nothing left but his presence. There's nothing left but the divine reality. So let's just go ahead and just be. It's okay to just be. There's nothing to think about, nothing to do, no responsibilities. It's just you and God. Hmm. And if you catch yourself following thoughts that come through your mind, that's okay. Have compassion on yourself, but just go back to just being again. Go back to just resting again. Be attentive, but be attentive and rest, not with a specific thought, just with your present moment. If you need help staying focused, you can focus on your breath. Don't change your breath. Just be attentive of your in inhalation and your exhalation. Give your mind something to rest on. You can rest on your breath. Okay, I don't know about you, but I feel better. Okay, so the Christian message is, of course, there's different versions of this, and I, I'm, this, I'm not here to teach theology or Christian theology, okay? But uh, the Christian message ultimately is that Jesus Christ has united and connected every human being Okay, whether you're Christian or not, even if you're not, whatever, with, with the divine reality, with God. Okay, and so I want to read a quote to give me some validity here. Uh, this is from Karl Barth. Uh, he's the most influential Christian theologian of the 20th century. Okay, uh, and here's, here's what he has to say. He says, what is Christian is secretly but fundament fundamentally identical with what is universally human. It is Christ that reveals the true nature of man. So look at that. He says that a Christian and a human being are fundamentally identical. Okay. So this is the mystery that Paul talked about in Colossians, in Col Colossians 2. He says that there's, there's a secret, there's, there's a secret hidden mystery that God has been wanting to tell the whole world for ages and generations past. And what, what's the secret? He says, it's that Jesus Christ lives on the inside of you. God lives on the inside of you. Okay. Now, Paul was around right after, decades after Jesus Christ came and left. But he says there's, there's a secret truth about him, humanity that's been around for ages and generations. And it's the fact that Christ and God is inside of you. So the Christian message is not a message about insiders and outsiders good people and bad people, people who said the prayer and, and got into the club and those who are waiting in line on the outside. The Christian message is the fact that God loves you and likes you so much that he's included you in the divine reality. And he did this through the life of this person named Jesus Christ. And I can't get into the, all the implications. Again, this is not a theology class, uh, but that is the main message. And, you know, Paul also told his mentee Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.9, that God has saved us and called us to a holy life. Holy life just means special life, wondrous life, not like a morally good life, okay? Uh, not because of anything we have done. So it's not because you said the sinner's prayer or, or anything like that or accepted Jesus in, into your heart. 
but because of his own purpose and kindness. So God made up his mind that he wanted to do this, so he did it. This grace or this gift of divine union was given to us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. Before, before one human being was on the earth, God had already given all human beings the gift of his presence. So, you know, you were actually born one with God. You were born connected with God. You were born inside of this divine reality. Uh, the, 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 the Bible is clear that all things consist inside of Jesus Christ and also that Jesus Christ can, lives inside of you. So there's, there, there's this beautiful diversity of life. I'm not me. I mean, I'm not you and you're not me, but yet we're still connected. And, and, and what I do affects you and what you do affects me. And in the same way, we are connected and we are within the divine reality. And, and so when we learn to, and we're going to get there, but when we learn to be aware of this reality, because that is possible, and it's not this like super special thing, it is special, but it's also normal because it's, it's, it's our normal way that we were meant to be living the whole time. We will be free. We will be happy. We, we will be other centered. We will be patient. We will be calm. We will, we will be good. We won't cling to things thinking they're going to make us happy because we are in a place of happiness because God is happiness. God is peace. God is calm. And we're going to live in that. So to be connected with God is, is to be connected with a God in a way that he is connected with himself. What does that mean? I'll explain it to you. So the Christian message teaches that God is three people who are so connected and so in love that they live inside of each other. And I think that's beautiful because most people think of God as like a Gandalf guy in the sky with his, he's on his throne and, and he's, he's white and he has a beard and he's mad. But, but, but the Christian, but that's not Christian actually, technically for sure, for sure. This, you know, you may disagree with me on some things, but Christianity clearly teaches that God is father, son, and Holy spirit, three people, three distinct, diverse people, but they're so in love and they're so connected that they live and operate as one. And so if they created us, it only makes sense that they, they created us to participate in this relationship. And that's why Jesus himself said, before he went to go be crucified, in John 14, 20, he says, on the day that I resurrect from the dead, you're going to realize something. Not you're going to enter into something. You're going to realize something. You're going to realize that I am inside of the Father. I am inside of God. I am one with God. I'm not just this regular guy. And you're also going to realize that you are inside of me and that I am inside of you. On that day, you will realize. So right now, realize that you are already connected with God. You are already connected with Jesus. There's nothing you can do to get out of this place or nothing you can do to work yourself into this place. That's just the way it is. And again, to go back to 2 Timothy 1.9, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose. This is his idea. We live in his world, and he chose us to live inside of him, and that's where we live. Okay? So because this is who we are, it's natural for us to live in awareness of God's presence. We were born into this world this way. So what's the problem? How come I have an anger problem? How come I have an addiction problem? How come I, I'm depressed? What's going on? If, if you're telling me I'm one with God, what the heck? <laughs> we all go through this. We all, we all even Jesus had this moment where, where he was never separate from God, but he really felt it. And that's why he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He, he felt what we feel when we feel abandoned and we feel alone. And trust me, I've been there. I've been there. So I want to tell you a story about an experiment that some scientists did. They had these little mice, a group of mice, and they lived in a little mouse house, okay, like Disney's mouse house or whatever. And these mice weren't allowed to see any horizontal lines. Everything they saw was a vertical line or like a curved line. They, they, from the time they were born until whatever, they, 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 they did not see horizontal lines. So what happened was the scientists started to put these horizontal wires throughout their house and the mice couldn't see 
the wires and they would run into the wires. They would get all bloody and it was kind of not, it was kind of gross. They would get hurt because they, they were running into them and trying to bite through them. They couldn't, they, they literally couldn't see what was in front of them. So what does this tell us about our perception? If that's true for the, the physical eyes of some mice, maybe there's a correlation to our soul not being able to see the divine reality that's always here. So that's the problem, is just that we can't see. And, and you're going to have to take it on faith on what I'm saying, but, but that is the issue. And, and, and again, it's not just what I teach. This is what Christian monks and, and meditators have been saying for the past 2,000 years, that we just, we just can't see what's in front of us. And so they give us practices, which involve silence and stillness, which are not boring and they're not hard, but they give us these practices so that we can learn to see. Eventually, the mice started to get the hint, and they start their, their eyes developed, and they were able to see the horizontal lines that were there the whole time. And so in the same way, we can develop our, our, the, the senses of our soul to be able to be aware of this presence that's always with us. So there's a few things I want to say about, you know, why we don't get it, why we're not aware of, of this divine love and reality that's always around us. Uh, so hear me out, but simply put, we are distracted. Honestly, it, it, it's an ultimate epic distraction, but it's, it's that easy. We're just distracted. You know, one of my favorite uh, reality shows is uh, Hell's Kitchen. I love Gordon Ramsay. I love him just like cussing people out in anger. I think it's hilarious. I like to watch the uncensored version. And in that show, you know, it's high stress. They're, not only are they on a TV show, they're, they're cooking for one of the, the world's best chefs. And you see these moments where they are stressed out and Gordon Ramsay is in their face and he's yelling at them to get their attention and they just don't hear it. It goes over their heads. His presence is there. His reality is there. His words are there. But to their perception, he's not there. And this is similar to us not experiencing the presence of God. We're just distracted. And we've built up walls of distraction for decades of our life. And they become habits. They become natural ways of living and perceiving our world and our reality. So it's natural for us not to see. Now, the true nature of, of human beings is to see, is to be aware, but we have drifted from that and we've behaved in a way that has blocked out what's true about us and true about our connection with God. Excuse me here. The author of The Cloud of Unknowing, which is one of Christianity's most famous books on meditation, he says, everything that you think about is situated above you for that time and lies between you and your God. And he compares thoughts to this separation. You can't see. He says that when you're thinking something, it's like you're an archer and you're focused on your target. Your attention is on your target. And so you can't see what's behind you or around you. So when we're, when we're, when we're so focused on our thoughts and what we think and what we believe and our judgments and our opinions, and when we're so stuck in our internal activity, we're, we're, we're blocking the presence that's all we're already with us. So that, that's just like a day-to-day, moment-to-moment thing that, we, that we're just so used to. But the good news is we, we can fix that, okay? And we do that through silence and stillness. The other issue is that we've also put our trust and sense of safety in a bunch of stuff that is not God. And we call those attachments. Maybe you are obsessed with being successful. Maybe you are obsessed with being rich. Maybe you are obsessed with being loved. Maybe you are obsessed with feeling pleasure. So you do drugs. Maybe you're, there, are, there are these things that we attach ourselves to in our soul and we find our safety and pleasure in them. And so again, these things distract us and obscure the presence of God that's already here. John of the Cross, he's a doctor of the church. There's only about 36 of those, I think. What does he have to say? He says, those are decidedly hindered then from attainment of this high state of union with God 
who are attached to any understanding, feeling, imagining, desire, or way of their own, or to any of their works or affairs, and know not how to detach and denude themselves of these impediments. And again, when he says union with God, he's not denying that you're already one with God. He said that earlier in, in his works, but he's talking about living it, enjoying it, experiencing it. So again, like I said, we find safety and we find pleasure in all of these things. And so our heart, even subconsciously and unconsciously, our heart has its grip and it's hugging these things. And we wonder why we're not aware of God's presence. Well, we're too busy attached to, again, pleasure, success, money, praise of others, fill in the blank. And we're also running from things. We're busy and our attention is on the fact that we're running from things. We're running from pain, fear, defeat, rejection, loneliness, boredom. We're running from these things. We're, 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 we, we, we don't want to be around these things. So when we feel these things, we get all worked up on how we can get out of it. Again, another distraction. If we can learn to just be and let the dust settle, let the, let the, the motion of the ocean just settle, what we're going to find is we're going to find that God is there. If you have a body of water and the body is all agitated and, and moving around, you can't see to the bottom of the lake, you can say. And you can't see your own reflection because of the motion. But when there's stillness and the water is calm and calms down, what happens? You can see to the bottom and you can see your reflection. You can see. It's the same way with us being aware and seeing with the eyes of our soul and our heart the presence of God that's within us. We can't do that when there's all kinds of motion and commotion in our mind and in our heart. It's, it's that easy, but also that big of a task because it's easier said than done. But the good news is we're going to talk about how to do it. And the practices are easy, but we have to take them serious. So this commotion that I talked about distracts us. And I've said it again and again, but a good teacher repeats himself. So the answer to calm the waters of our heart and our mind so that we would just naturally be, oh my, we, we would be aware that, oh my God, God's here. The answer is silence and the answer is stillness. Silence is stillness of your thoughts. Silence is stillness of audio, like thoughts, you hear thoughts, right? That's right. And stillness is when you sometimes your emotion, you know, uh, it's always going everywhere and it feels it's like vibrating and ah, it's agitated. You make that still because that's a commotion that's stirring up the water. So when we let the waters calm, the waters of our heart and our mind, and we enjoy silence and stillness, our attachments fall away. Our clinginess to pleasure, success, uh, people, drugs, etc., falls away. Our distractions falls away. The walls come down. And what's left? The one thing that will never come down, God. You see the God that was there the whole time. So we're going to, uh, I'm going to do a quick slideshow for you, and then I'm going to come back to the video. So uh, if you get kicked out of the class or if you accidentally log yourself out, come back in. You might be in the waiting room for 10, 15 minutes because I'm going to be in the slideshow. But wait, because I'm going to come back and pick you up, okay? But just don't touch anything so you, you don't get logged out, okay? So let me share my screen here. So I told you my two cents. And I want to show you what, um, what someone greater than me has, has said, okay? So let me... Get my screen here. Okay. So we're going to talk about a guy named Gregory Misa. And if I, there we go. So Gregory Nisa was born in 330, a long time ago. Uh, when he was 31 years old, he became a monk, and he decided to take stillness and silence and solitude seriously. So he went and lived, like, in the desert in, like, a prayer cell for 10 years, okay? 10 years. 
So this guy, if anybody knows what happens when you get silent and still, this guy knows. Okay, I haven't even done it for 10 years, and I, I've had some good results, but this guy must have had some amazing stuff. Uh, in the year 381, so 10 years later after his, his silence uh, time of his life, he was a heavy influence at the Christian council of, I'm going to say this wrong, Constantinople. So uh, this council was when the deity of the Holy Spirit was added to the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed is like the basic uh, statement of beliefs that like all Christians pretty much take on, most of them. And so uh, the Nicene Creed was written before, but they never talked about the divinity of the Holy Spirit. And so they met again, the Eastern uh, Church leaders met again, and Gregory of Nyssa and his older brother Basil, they were the guys that pretty much like their ideas were, were what went into the, the, the Nicene Creed, the full Nicene Creed. So this is an important guy. The, the Gregory of Nyssa is a guy that shaped the foundation of Christian theology. So he's not just some nobody, okay? But he wasn't just a theologian who talked, 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 talked. He was a theologian, but also a mystic and a monk and a meditator. And he took silence seriously. And so I want, to, I want us to go over his thought process because personally, I follow his thought process. So let's read a quote from him. He says, it is on those of us who remain in this calm and quiet mode of life. There it is there, calm and quiet mode of life that truth will shine forth, enlightening the eyes of our soul with its beams. This truth, which was revealed by the indescribable and mysterious illumination that appeared to Moses, is God. So he's talking about Moses' encounter with the burning bush when, when Moses first met God. Okay? So... Gregory of Nyssa, he had what I'm going to call steps to union. Again, you're already one with God, but we're talking about how do we get to a place where we're aware of his presence all the time. And so this is how Nyssa looked at it. Steps to union. Number one, he, he talked about light. And that was when Moses met God in the burning bush. So that's knowing God or knowing about God or getting to know God or have a relationship with God through knowledge, words, beliefs. So when I say things like God is loving, God is kind, God is exactly like Jesus Christ, God is Jesus Christ, God is Father, Son, Spirit, all of these things that are saying, which are good, this is, this, this is just the first step in our relationship to union with God. And so Nisa compares this to light. And, we're, and I'm explaining his thought process because we're going to go over a few quotes, but they won't make sense if you don't understand how he thought. So I'm kind of giving you the cheat sheet before we get in there, okay? Step number two, he talked about darkness. Sounds scary, right? It doesn't have to be, but that's, that's the word. So Moses met God in darkness. So the story goes that when Moses uh, went to meet God, this, is, this was when he got the Ten Commandments, and, and, and he, he kept going to the, to the holy mountain to see God. It says that the mountain was covered in darkness and that God dwelt in darkness. Kind of like a scary movie, right? But this is the story. You go read it. I think it's Exodus 19. So, so Nisa says, talks about how after light, we know God through darkness. And we're going to explain what that means. So it's knowing God through what the mystics call unknowing. That sounds confusing, so I'll make it simple for you. It simply means to not rely on our finite intellect, logic, rational, rationale. We're not going to know. Listen, at first, we started to know things about God, know facts about God. But then you get to a place when there, there's a ceiling. Your mind can go no further. Your mind can take you no further. There's still more reality of God, but your mind can't take you there because it, it's about intimacy and relationship, not about your brain, okay? And then after you go through this, this experience and, you know, as you meditate and you'll have that experience, uh, you, you, again, you realize that your, your, your brain can't comprehend God. And so you let that go. And then there's a new kind of light. It's kind of like when Moses, after Moses came down from meeting God, it says that he shone, he was like an angel, like, like bright light came out, of, came out of his face, that he had to wear like a veil, kind of like a, like a wedding, like a bride veil to kind of like cover, his, cover this light. And so Nisa does talk about knowing God in, in, in a union kind of light. It's knowing God through the heart, through love and through wonder. And so this includes one and two. You don't lose one and two. You still can 
can you know talk about facts about God. Oh, God is awesome. God is so nice. God is so forgiving. And you also understand God is so wonderful. I my, my brain can't get it. You know, my you know when I try to see God with my mind, all I see is darkness because my my mind cannot comprehend God. But you live in this place where now you know God and you know His presence and you're aware of His presence. But it's not the way that you knew Him before in one and two. It's this indescribable and beautiful knowing. So let's see what he has to say about it, because that was just me explaining him, okay? He says, what is the meaning of Moses entering the darkness and then seeing God? What is described seems to be opposed to the first theophany, which means like a uh, meeting of God. For at that point, God was seen in light, but here he is seen in the darkness. So again, Moses first met God in the burning bush, that's light. Now he's meeting God on this mountain full of darkness. He's meeting God in the dark. Nisa says, religious knowledge starts out as light, the burning bush, when it first appears. Okay. But the more the spirit in its forward progress attains by a greater and more perfect application to the understanding of the realities and comes closer to contemplation, the more it realizes that the divine nature is invisible. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds kind of confusing. So I'm going to go ahead and give you the Jesse version, okay? So here, let, let me just kind of rephrase this for you, and I promise you it's accurate. The more time you spend in silence and stillness, the more you realize for yourself that God's nature and reality is invisible to your understanding. In other words, God doesn't make sense to your brain. Okay, so let's, let's go back to Nisa. One second. Okay, so God doesn't make sense to our brain. What does Nisa say next? And, and, and these quotes are, are one, one paragraph. Having left behind all appearances, not only those perceived by the senses, but also those which the intelligence believes itself to see, the spirit enters more and more into the interior until it penetrates by its striving, even unto the invisible and the unknowable, and there it sees God. Again, let me give you the Jesse uh, translation. As you continually loosen your soul's grip on the things you're attached to, both physical things, so this could be you know, uh, substances, this could be food, like, you know, gluttony, the right things like that. And mental things, example, your beliefs about God, believe it or not, some people are very attached to their belief about God, to their doctrine, to what their religion says, okay? So when you loosen your grip to those things, you enter more and more into your heart of hearts until you fully enter your heart. Your heart of hearts is a world that makes no sense at all to your brain. And there you see and recognize the God who was always with you. Okay, back to Nisa. The true knowledge of God that it seeks and the true vision of him consists in seeing that he is invisible because he transcends all knowledge and is hidden on all sides by his incomprehensibility. Okay, let me come back here while you soak that up. Okay, I think we're back. My video is just lagging, but I'm pretty sure it is airing. And I know you can hear me. So Nisa talks about knowing God through light, knowing God through darkness in these quotes. In other places, he talks about knowing God through a different kind of light, but we're not going to get into that. I want to focus on the light and the darkness that we read about. So, you know, Nisa was a guy, again, who is a theologian. He is a influential theologian. He gave us theology. He gave us knowledge, knowledge of God, the light kind of knowledge. So he knows what he's talking about. But then at the same time, the guy who gives us accurate information about God 
says, if you really want to know God, you're not going to know him through accurate information. You're not going to know him through your brain or your intellect or what your, what, what your mind knows. Well, which is it, Nisa? Do I know God th through doctrine and teachings of the church or do I, do I know God through, through not that? You know, we, let, let, let's just embrace, this is, this is what we taught, but let's just embrace both. There's a time and a place for everything. Theology about God is kind of like a baseball card. You got the picture of the baseball player, you got the facts and the stats, and that's great. And you love this baseball player and you love this team and you keep it in your wallet and it's, it's a really nice card and you look at it and you enjoy it. And sometimes when you're not with the baseball player, it comforts you to have good theology. But when the baseball player is in front of you and he wants to play a ball game with you, you put the card away, don't you? You want to be intimate with the God. You want to live with God. You don't always want to talk about God and think about God. When a husband and, and a wife or, or, you know, a partner and a partner, you know, ha are, are having intercourse, they're not thinking facts about each other. They're enjoying each other. There's different ways of, of, of having a relationship with somebody. And so there are different ways that you're going to connect with God. And so you, you can connect with God again through light. You can connect with God through what Nisa calls darkness. And when we practice silence and stillness, that is darkness. What, why, why, why is that called darkness? Why does he have to use, sounds like, like, again, like a Halloween thing? Well, because when, you know, when you're not listening to stuff, you're silent. And when you're not, your, your soul is not, you know, moving around in that commotion that we talked about earlier, it's kind of like your soul and your mind are like in darkness, like in a dark room. You don't see, you don't hear. You're just in this calm, serene place. So let's find, let, let's talk about let's talk about silence. Now let's talk about how we actually do this because it's easier said than done. Before I do that, though, I want to talk about what it looks like because there might be some misunderstanding here. So if you think that when I say silence and and uh, stillness, excuse me here. If you think that I'm talking about you having a blank mind like a zombie, <laughs> you are wrong. That is not what I'm saying. I don't mean to say it so bluntly, but you know what I mean? Like, that's not what I'm saying, okay? You're still going to have thoughts. You're still going to have things go on in your soul, in your heart. There's thoughts. There's daydreams. There's desires. There's fears. There's opinions. There's this. There's that. There's any, any internal activity, you're going to have those things. But it's not going to be this repeating things. Let me let, let, let's go back to the lake example. When I say silence and stillness, I don't mean that you're going to be like just like a frozen lake, like no no thought. You're 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 frigid and you're frozen, and no, I'm not going to let any thoughts in, and I'm going to stay blank. And I, no, that's not what we're saying. You're going to be like a calm lake. It's natural. There's ripples in the water. The wind blows on the water. There's a duck that goes by. There's little fish that swim. There's still stuff that's going to happen in your mind and in your heart. That's not the problem. The issue is not that we have thoughts. The issue, like I said earlier, is that we pay too much attention to what we think. We add thoughts to our thoughts. We add commentary to our thoughts. So let's say we think a thought you know, oh, I am not uh, liked. Nobody likes me. That thought is like a bird that's flying through your head. You know what? You couldn't stop it. It's okay. Let the bird keep flying. But what we do is we, 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 we grab the bird, the thought that says, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I'm not lovely or I'm not loved or no one likes me or whatever I said. And we go, yeah, you're right. No wonder yesterday so-and-so didn't call me back. No wonder. And we start to add commentary and more thoughts to the thought. And we talk to the bird. And the bird, it's like a parrot. And then, and then the parrot goes, yeah, and think about this. And then we go, yeah, da, da, da. And we go back and forth. And we're, we're like so absorbed in our thinking that we're not present. And again, if, if we would stop doing that more and more, you will start to realize when the when the when you stop grabbing the birds and stop that habit, you're going to realize this presence and this stillness and this beauty that's with you all the time. I promise it's with you. I promise it's with you. 
we're, we've just put a bunch of stuff on top of it. It's like it's like we've buried treasure. There's gold inside of you, but we've put a bunch of dirt over it. We're we're paying attention to the dirt and the thoughts and and, and the sensations and things like that. We feel agitated, and then we get so oh, we, we we get concerned that we're agitated. And if we would just learn to be still and just not pay attention to our agitation, be present with it, but not in a way where you're paying attention to it. Again, when we silence and stillness we will find that things are okay. You will realize for yourself that things are okay. So silent prayer, it's meditation. We'll call it silent prayer. It's an act of faith. You are choosing to act on the truth that hopefully you realize, maybe something in you really believes. You know what? I, I don't know why I believe you. I believe that God is always here and I'm, I just can't see it. I believe that. So when you choose to meditate and, and practice silent prayer, and then throughout your day, you know, be mindful of yourself so that you don't get so that you don't pay attention to your thoughts and all of your internal activity, you're you're choosing to act to live by faith that I'm not going to grab onto these things for safety, pleasure, or entertainment because I believe that God is here. And, 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 and the, the God that is here will reveal, not, not that he's going to show up and say, hey, I showed up now because you did the good thing. No, 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 nothing like that. He wants you to, he wants you to be aware. He wants you to be happy. The issue, is, like we said, is we're distracted. So we know when I let go of my distractions, I have faith that I'm going to see what's always been here. And it's going to feel good. It's going to feel healthy. And it's going to feel great. So let, let's talk about the practical of how we do this. So number one, this is really important for me to say because I'm going to give you some techniques and some aids and supports. But sometimes we get too absorbed in the supports and those become new distractions for us. Okay. Uh, they're holy distractions. It's better to, for example, if you're meditating on the, on, on, a, on, on the form of a cross, you can say, it's better to do that than to be thinking about, you know, your, your, all of your thoughts. But ultimately, we, we want to be free from all attachments and all distractions. So what I want to tell you is that, like I said earlier, when we meditated, in the same way that you can physically rest your mind, you can mentally rest your soul. It might sound too good to be true. It might sound impossible because we're so used to that not being true. But I promise you it's true. And when I learned this technique, it made all the difference for the world in me. All the difference. The same way that you just sit down when you want to sit down, you can rest your mind, you can rest your thoughts, you can rest your emotions, you can rest your desires, you can rest any internal activity. Because all internal activity, we think of it as like, oh, a thought attacked me. I got to fight this thought. I got to not pay attention to this thought. We see it as something other than ourselves. But your thoughts are just you. They're a manifestation of you. You are in control. And so you can be the one to rest that thought, rest your attention to that thought, rest your, your, your internal agitation or not feeling good or feeling too excited about something. There's good excitement, but then there's bad excitement, too excited where you'll, you'll push someone out of the way because you want to go, you know, get the dollar on the ground. That's not, that's too, that's, you're attached to that thing, right? I promise you, you can do this. And when I first started doing it, Sure. You know, I'll be honest. I had to do it 20 times every couple minutes, but it's not hard. It's, it, yeah, I had to be diligent, but I had to be diligent to let go, diligent to relax. It's a good diligence. It's not something that's like hard. You don't feel tired after, oh my God, I, I just let go and relax, you know, 20 times. Whew. You don't feel that way. You, you still feel good because I'm telling you to stop. Stop. Get off the hamster wheel of your thinking. Get off the hamster wheel of your feeling. Get off the hamster wheel of your daydreaming. Just relax. Rest. Stop. Calm. Stop. Calm. And, and like, any, like any habit, you get so good at it that you no longer have to do it every 20 times a minute. Then you do it one time an hour. And then you do it for me maybe every few weeks now. I, I have something in me where I'm like, oh, yeah, I got to just rest from that. Oh, okay. It just becomes normal for you. Second nature. I promise you. I promise you. So do that when you can. And, all, and, and again, do that daily. Do that as much as possible. But sometimes that just doesn't work. I understand. And sometimes that, sometimes you're just so stressed or maybe you're having a panic attack or maybe just this, there's so much going on in your psyche on the inside that the meditators and the mystics of the Christian faith have given us things to help us do this. Okay, so let's, let's, let's talk about those.
So number one, a still body is going to help you. If your body is still, your mind can be still. Okay, that's super important. That's why we do that. And, you know, uh, Eva Gris, yeah, I'm going to say his name wrong, Eva Grius, he's from the fourth century. They, they call him the greatest theologian of the desert. He says, let us sit still and keep our attention fixed within ourselves so that we advance in holiness. And again, holiness is like an old word. It just means like healthiness, you know, good health of our soul. Okay, so, so, so the Christian mystics teach us to just have a still body. And again, my best recommendation, whether you're sitting on the couch, on a chair, on the meditation cushion that you buy, if you have a straight back, that's good. You know, if I work with you one-on-one, -on -one, we can talk about talk about other things, but that's the main thing is a straight back and the rest of your body can be relaxed, okay? Because you want to balance relax, but also paying attention. So when I said rest your mind, I don't mean, you know, pretend you're at the beach and just like zone out. You still want to be mindful. You still want to be aware. You still want to be awake because if you're not awake, the next thought will come and you're just you're, you're going to fall into its trap. So you want to be rested and relaxed, but you want to be rested and relaxed with eyes wide open so that you don't fall into the traps of your mind. Okay, so a still body, that's good. Uh, the Christian mystics also gave us the prayer word. Now, the prayer word is not exclusive to Christianity. So, for example, people talk about this popular thing, TM. Uh, it's pretty popular. They just use the prayer word. It's, you know, it's not a secret. They just, okay. Uh, but Christians do it as well. And so the prayer word, there's different ways that Christians have, have mystics have taught us to use it. But ultimately, it's something to bring us back from our distraction. So when you find yourself getting distracted, you have a word that's like a safe place, an anchor. That word can be God, love, Jesus. It could be, you know, uh, the Jesus prayer. Sort of the, the Orthodox Church is big on this. So they, you know, there's different versions of it, but a common version is Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. What they're doing is they're 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 bringing their attention back from distraction. Back, remember the, remember the commotion of the water. We don't want the commotion. We want stillness and rest and silence. And so the prayer word brings us back to that that place. So you can do it when you're distracted. But some of the Christian monks taught to, to do it, like, like in TM, how they do it, to just repeat the word over and over again. And that's probably a good idea when you're like in a really bad place, you know, maybe like a panic attack or something. Like you just put your focus on this one word. So again, let's say your prayer word is, is, is you know, Jesus, have mercy on me. Jesus, have mercy on me. Jesus, have mercy on me. Jesus have mercy on me. When you put your attention on that, your restful attention, so don't get too worked up. Again, you got to be relaxed, aware but relaxed. What happens is you're no longer paying attention to those thoughts. You're no longer paying attention to the thing that was bothering you. And so, the, you know, whatever you pay attention to, you feed, you, you keep propped up. So when, you, when you're not paying attention to those things, they'll start to fall away and then uh, you'll start to feel better. So that's an, another tip you can do. The reason why, you know, we we do the prayer word in that way, if you use it that way, is because if you can't keep your mind rested all on your own, which I believe you can do, but I, I understand you, you can, you know, get tired of that. What you're doing is you're giving your mind something to do. Like I said earlier, it's better to have a holy distraction than to have, you know, all these other distractions. And also, it's better to focus on one thing than the, the variety of things your mind brings to you. Because your mind is like, you know, you know, what's for dinner? I can't believe so-and-so yelled at me. I'm really depressed. Oh my God, I'm so happy about the new TV. Your mind is like everywhere, paying attention to like a million different things. And to borrow a term from the Buddhist, just because it's a, a brilliant term, it's, it's the monkey mind, the monkey brain. The monkey is just jumping all over the house. And so when we focus on one thing, like the prayer word, we're, we're learning to unify ourselves, to embody ourselves in one thing, one attention, instead of your attention being scattered like a ping pong ball. And when we say the prayer word, again, we're not thinking about the prayer word because we're resting from thinking. <laughs> we're just using the prayer word as something to keep us stable. Personally, I don't use the prayer word but I understand how helpful it can be. And I do know how to teach people to use it if you, if you resonate with that, okay? Another thing that Christians give us is the breath. 
some people think, oh, the breath, isn't, isn't that like a, a Buddhist thing or a Hindu thing? No, Christian monks have been using the breath to help in meditation. So let me, let me, let me drop some names here so I get some validity, right? So in the second century, there's this guy named Theophilus of Antioch. He was the seventh su successor to Peter, to the apostle Peter. So there's Peter, and then six guys later, or seven guys later, there's this guy, Theophilus. And he says, God's breath vibrates in yours, in your voice. It is the breath of God that you breathe and you are unaware of it. So the breath is not a religious thing, a Christian thing, a Buddhist thing. The breath is a divine thing. The breath is a human thing. So it's okay to be present with your breath. It, 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 it's actually, if you don't want to use the prayer word, you can use the breath. Just be with your breath. Don't force yourself to breathe. Just you let watch yourself breathe the way that your body breathes all on its own. Uh, Gregory Palamas or Palmas, uh, 14th century, he was the Archbishop of Thessalonica. If I'm saying that right, he's pretty big in the Orthodox Church, like you know those guys with the hats and the things like that. He says, pay attention to the exhalation and inhalation of your breath. So that while you are watching it, the intellect too may be held in check. Again, just different ways of saying the same thing. You pay attention to your breath, you're no longer paying attention to your mind. You're no longer paying attention to your thoughts that are trying to go after things or run from things or fear or hope or things like that. And some of the mystics would use the breath and the prayer word together. So John Climacus, 7th century monk, he said, let the remembrance of Jesus be with your every breath, then indeed you will appreciate the value of stillness. So he didn't mention that the prayer word, but but uh, some monks do, you know, mention the prayer word. And I'm, I'm going to recommend a book at the end if you're interested in stuff like that. But a uh, brilliant book. But they do talk about every time you breathe out, you know, say say your prayer word. Okay. But notice what he says. He says he says, remember Jesus with every breath. Then indeed you will appreciate the value the value of stillness. So we see we see a connection here. I'm going to give you two more tips that, that I, I can't, I, I don't have quotes from Christian mystics about, but I'm sure they're in there, but that, that I personally use. It's your eyes and it's your ears. So, so there's sound meditation. So that's when you just listen to whatever sounds are going on. Maybe there's construction going on outside. Maybe your people that you live with are out having a conversation. You don't listen to listen in. You don't listen to the words. Oh, what are they saying? What does that mean? You're just listening to the noise as if it had no meaning. You're just listening to, to, the, to the pure audio, to the, to the pure noise. And as you listen to, as your ears are listening to the noise, you are aware of yourself listening to the noise. Your attention is on that, not on your thoughts. Or you can use the eyes. Listen, your eyes are, all, are always working. Your eyes are always mindful. Your eyes are always aware. Meditation is not hard. You're just tapping into what's already going on naturally. So what you do is you start to be present with your eyes that are already paying attention. And you just rest in that place. And you do that instead of, again, paying attention to thoughts. So these are practical things uh, that you can do. I want to say a couple. I want to say two things. Number one, there's so much more to be said, of course, about meditation, union with God, how to meditate, and so I encourage you to to connect with me. You know, I offer mentorship so that I can help you on your journey. I also encourage you to do this with a teacher, and here's why. Number one, it's just always good to have a teacher, you know, to help you in, in things you're learning. But also, listen as you get quiet. You know, you you know what you're going to deal with. A lot of your, your junk, a lot of your trauma, your wounds, your fears, you're, they're, 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 you're, you're going to start to notice these things. And so it's just good to have, you know, a, a teacher and things like that. But what I'm also going to say, though, is even though there's more to be said, everything I've said in this talk is enough. I've talked about how you're one with God. I've talked about how it is orthodox to believe that meditation can bring us to know God in a way that we know him beyond our intellect. I've talked about how you can do this. 
And so if you listen to this, and, and you're, you're going to get the replay, those of you who bought the ticket or if you're a patron, but if, if you watch this over and over, the answers are in this talk. A lot of times we read a book and then we toss it out and look for another book. And the first book had so much more. Listen, there are books that I've read again and again and again. And every time I read it, I get new things out of it. So on one hand, I'm giving you comprehensive information that can really change your life. And your ego and your isolated self, it might say, oh, I don't want to do that. Oh, yeah, sure, or whatever. More thoughts just distracting you from the truth that can help you. Why don't you go try it? Why don't you go, instead of just listening to an opinion of a thought, why don't you go try this out? But on the other hand, again, read more books, connect with me, connect with someone else you want to connect with who, who practice this. You know, I, I don't want, I, I want to be careful how I say this because I, I don't want to make it seem like, you know, I'm, you know, uh, showboating or, or whatever the term is, you know. But listen, I've actually practiced this stuff. I've struggled with, you know, a love and sex addiction. I've struggled with, with jealousy. I've struggled with anger. I've struggled with the frustration of not being happy and, and, and wondering where the heck God is. I've, I've deeply, deeply, in the things that I'm talking about, I've done, and they've worked. Now, I'm not going to claim to be enlightened. We'll use that word, okay? But what I can say is I've had enough enlightening moments that were both gradual and sudden, big and little, that I am a totally different person, and every day I truly do live as a happy person. Now, if I stopped meditating and if I stopped being aware, of course I would go back to the old way. So I'm not a super, super person, superhuman. I have to keep up. But again, it's easy to keep up, but I got to keep up. I got to take it serious. But I'm just like you. I am just like you. I'm not special. God doesn't create special people. Maybe Jesus was special. I don't know. That's a different thing. But you and me, we're the same. God shows no favoritism. And whatever I did, you can do. And so if you're frustrated and if, if you're unfulfilled in life, listen, I enjoy life. I love life. I love culture. Look, I'm wearing a band shirt. I got a choker on. I love movies. I love, I love going for walks. I love being lazy in the park and talk. I love life. But I, 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 I've stopped looking for my ultimate fulfillment in the things of this life because they always let you down. People let you down. Things let you down. Politicians let you down. You know, intoxicants let you down, lovers let you down. Things in this life are always going to let you down if you look to them fully. Now, I can enjoy them when they're here and let them go when they're gone. And I can really enjoy them. I enjoy things now better than before, before I meditated. <laughs> but the reason why is because I have found my ultimate satisfaction in, the, in living in the awareness of this divine reality that's not only within me, but all around me. Christian mystics, they always will say the, these poems like, you know, like uh, um, St. Patrick. He says, Christ is above, Christ is below, Christ is to my left, Christ is to my right, Christ is in front of me, Christ is behind me, Christ is everywhere. They were living in this reality that God is everywhere. Everything is God. His presence is everywhere. He's within everything. And so when you decide to find your ultimate fulfillment and satisfaction in the divine reality of God, you're not going to be attached. You're not going to be obsessed. You're not going to you're not going to have these mental troubles and troubles of the heart because you found your answer. I know I found my answer, but you still enjoy life. You're still a normal person. <laughs> but you have a choice of what of what you're going to do with this information. You can just okay, whatever and then go back to your old ways of finding finding your safety and ultimate pleasure in in things in success and money and the praise of people and being accepted and substances, intoxicants. Or you can find your pleasure in God and you'll do that. You're going to find God. Again, I say find God, but he's always here. But you're, you're, you're going to learn to live in that awareness through silence and through stillness. So uh, before we do a, a Q&A, uh, the book that I recommend that I think is brilliant, I think this guy is brilliant, if, if you want to follow the Christian way, his name is Martin Laird, L-A-R-D. His book is called Into the Silent Land. So we're talking about silence. You want to live in the silent land, okay? And he 
he's a great writer. He uh, he's a great writer, and he 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 makes his points interesting, and he uses kind of like like stories and characters and stuff. But then he's also very practical, and and I think a lot of a lot of mystic books are like either too dense and boring, or they're not really practical. They're just like very flowery. But he is very practical, and he walks you through what it's like. Again, I did as well too. You can do what I said and you'll be good. You can get that book. Um, and I again, I also want to encourage you, you know, humansaredivine.blog is where you can find me. Um, and if you want me to mentor you, excuse me, that's human, uh, that's patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash humans are divine. Uh, and I can work with you and get you to where you want to be. And then I have my link tree with a bunch of links like podcasts and YouTube and blog and stuff like that. That's uh, Linktree, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E forward slash humans are divine. I, listen, I, I, I love people. I'm willing to connect with you and work with you one-on-one uh, -on -one and, and you can have your life change. And it's not because I'm special. It's not about me. Again, we're, we're following the tradition of other people. This, this, the, the stuff that I'm talking about, yes, I practiced it and got the results, so that's great. But I've also done my research and I know that I'm just doing what I'm just doing what they did. And so uh, so yeah.